for the 2021 NCGIS Virtual Conference. My name is Matthew McGlam. I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, this session is entitled Spatial Anchoring with Dave Michelson. I appreciate him uh, submitting an abstract and being a part of the program. I'm looking forward to this presentation. Just a couple of quick items for those of you tuning in. Just to the right of the video feed, you should see a green icon for the chat. Feel free to open that up and go ahead and join the chat. If you submit questions or have questions, you can go ahead and type them in as Dave goes through his presentation. At the end, we will go through the questions and uh, he'll have a chance to respond to those. Um, in the event that uh, we don't get a chance to get through all the questions or you wanna follow up with him uh, directly, he does have his email address on the screen, so feel free uh, to reach out and with that said, I won't delay any further and I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Yeah, um, thank you. And one of the, first off, I'm Dave Michelson. I'm a software designer at EMAC. Um, I think Jeff Searle in that open plenary said that he leaves it up to the mapping, mapping geeks and nerds. And I think that that's what this talk is really about. Um, a little bit more in psychology too. And it's one of the things um, I've been really getting into it with um, a master's degree I've been working on. This is a report out of um, a study that I did. So jumping in, so why I did the study. So one of the things that I started noticing working through the years, and, and you know, I've been doing this for over 25 years working with um, maps and since the early nineties really doing mapping on, on the web. So one of the things I started hearing pretty quick was when someone asked about something like crime, location and, and they would say, I want to know about all the crime around my house or the school or whatever it was. And when I'd come back to them with that answer, they were always really surprised about what happened. Um, I think they expected the results to be a lot less, like a lot less crime happening around that location. Um, then they'd start asking questions about the data and it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, good questions. They started saying that something was wrong. And I used to always wonder about that. And one of the things I thought is maybe it's just that people don't understand distance. It could be that um, Euclidean distance, just straight arrow distance as the bird flies is the wrong way to think about it. But either way, I started questioning, are just humans bad at estimating distance? And are they even worse when it comes to a web map? Um, and there's very little literature out there on that. In fact, there's none. Um, secondary, I attended some conferences um, and these were more with user experience type folks, and they started making claims in, in the, their talks. And they'd say, hey, look, walk and drive times um, are more relatable to humans instead of Euclidean distance. So maybe you should use them or use like city blocks. Um, and, and that kind of felt weird because there was no data to back that up. And city blocks that, that weren't, might work well in very urban areas, but in suburban areas and rural areas, not so much. Um, and with the lack of um, any literature or any real data behind that to back it up. I just kind of doubted that. It didn't feel right. Um, so I wanted to find out a little bit about that too. So I decided to, um, in my master's degree, to do a, a independent study. Um, it's a master's of liberal arts and science. So I'm pretty much free to do whatever I want. Um, in a lot of ways, I call it make your own masters. Um, in, in this case, I just did an independent study. I created a website ask people to draw um, what and estimate distances on maps. And I'm gonna kind of step through those different questions that I asked. So to start off, I asked three questions and I asked, um, asked them randomly. So I had, um, so, and the one thing I wanted to make clear about the questions were that um, I wanted to make sure that they did not influence the distance estimates. And I'll get in that, into that a second. And once somebody searched for that location, I also randomized the zoom level. And this is gonna be really important as I get further into the talk. Um, but I wanted to make sure that that zoom level wasn't influencing anything either. Um, the questions can be real problematic because they can fall under um, cognitive psychology biases. And one of them is an availability heuristic. Um, and, and that's this, this tend, people tend to estimate something happening based on actual examples that you can think of. So with crime, if you find out and you hear about a bunch of break-ins on your street, you start to believe that this is more common than they really are, or vice versa. If you never hear about crime happening on the street or your neighborhood, you tend to think that um, 
front is lower than it really is. And, and that probably has a lot more to do with the cr crime, crime answer that people would say, oh, when you go out a mile, why is there so much crime? There's probably a little bit of this heuristic happening that they don't hear about this crime, so they tend to estimate lower. Um, but the vice versa could happen too. And um, step two, another set of random questions um, is I wanted to test those things that we talked about earlier. One, just draw a circle that represents one mile. And, and all of this is drawing a circle. Um, and then one that does a five minute walk and a five minute drive, um, pretty simple. And we can kind of show you real quick what that looks like. So person comes into the study and this is the actual study. They would click yes, they'll search, we'll search for Asheville since that's where I'm at. When you draw a circle, and, and again, this is random, um, estimate a circle, and then you would hit submit, right? So the radius of my circle was three miles. I was supposed to do the mile, or I think actually, it was a walk. I didn't even look at that. But anyway, it tells you how well you did. So the participant was allowed to make as many attempts at the circle they needed. They could zoom in, they could do all that stuff, just like on any map. I wanted to simulate a real experience with a map. Um, so that gives me a little bit less control in an experiment, which is not always great, but um, I'm much more into applied stuff. So I really wanted to make sure that um, what I did matched what happens in the lab. So for the methodology for accuracy, which um, I used a, what's called a one-sided t-test, and that's just for testing if the mean of a whole set of data observations is different from hypotheses. So when we're talking about um, distance, walk, and drive, there's a distance I'm expecting people to estimate at. So we need to make sure that it, how people are accurate is when the p-values from those tests come back greater than 0 0.05. And that's basically saying that there's only a 5% chance that this would have randomly happened. Um, and that's pretty much the standard in, in t-test for most, most statistical analysis that um, we just devise. So kind of let's talk about um, that distance estimation, what we expect. Um, the model category, I mean, that's pretty easy. That's 5,280 feet. Um, um, with walk, this is where it gets a little bit squirrely. There's not an uh, exact number, but if we look at um, how fast people walk, it's usually three to four miles per hour. If you go with the lower one, it's about 1,320 feet, which is about a quarter of a mile. Um, the drive category is a little bit harder. Um, I did use 41 miles per hour, and that was based on the gas buddy study back in 2018, and that was across the US. Now, this can get tricky. In fact, when um, I ran the study, I had people um, send me messages actually angry and mad that um, it was too big and that they, where they live, there's too much traffic or they live in, the, in a, a more urban area and they could never drive that fast and that I overestimated it. That may be true, but the only thing I can go with is something that I can find in literature. And that's, that's about probably correct as far as if you took average, but it may not be really accurate, but you have to have something to base it on. So for the questions, so if we wanna make sure the questions had no influence on the distance, which is something I was interested in, we use ANOVA, which is analysis of variance. Um, the results here, the p-value has to be less than 0 0.05. That would tell us that um, we, there would be a 95% chance that the things didn't randomly happen when they're, um, when they're not equal. That's telling us that the questions did not affect it. <coughs> so real quick, the results. Um, I got a 466 observations total. That was really um, a good amount. Um, a German blogger had picked up on, on it somehow. I think I had written a blog post about some of the work I did in the initial phases. And um, it quickly jumped from around the 200 that I had initially had to like three, 400 and started approaching 500 before I had to turn off the... Um, data collection. So that's, that's a really good amount that makes stuff pretty significant. Um, and jumping in, this is just looking at raw data. So these are the distances submitted by the different distances. <clears throat> and you can start to get a feel for what how people submitted it. Now for statistic, statistical analysis, 
both ANOVA and T-TEST require that the, um, or assume and make the assumption that the data is um, distributed normally and this raw data, it's not. So typically what you have to do is normalize data when you do that. Um, one of the ways is logging the data. And that's what I did here. I'm basically logging the distance and we get um, a more normally distributed data set. So you can start seeing here that people are, how people estimated. And one of the things in literature talked about um, how the further the distance um, on distance estimation on maps, the um, more people underestimate. But then as the distance gets smaller, they start overestimating. And we see that here. So some of that past research of that, when we look at the walk, it's slightly overestimated. The miles just a little bit underestimated and the drive is really underestimated. Um, and that's probably a, a factor of two because I think that um, what people were telling me in those angry emails was that um, I, was I was overestimating also. So just, it's just a cool map it has no significance whatsoever. I just took all the circles people drew and dropped it over Asheville because that's where I live. Um, just so you could get a sense for like, what are the sizes, the different sizes of circles that people dropped along with that expected distance, which is the orange. And then that light blue, which is that mean submitted distance um, that a lot of the statistics are based on. <clears throat> so looking at accuracy, so this is, um, results of the t-test and what you're seeing here is um, confidence intervals. Um, the orange again is the distance we expected. Um, there is no mean really on here, but what you're seeing is that in no case, um, if you start looking at the p-values, <clears throat> in none of these cases were people accurate. And like I said before, the miles underestimated, um, overestimated just a little bit, and same with um, drive time and walk was a little bit underestimated. So it ends up that people are actually not accurate at estimating distance on maps at all, um, which is interesting. So you know that when you're building web apps and you're asking them questions about you know, distance, like things that are within a mile of anything, know that people are probably doing this when they're doing that. So that's like an important takeaway. And that's one of the things I wanted to learn about is when we're designing, and I'm designing software for the web, that especially with maps, that this, this is happening. So let's look at questions in accuracy. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure of is that the questions weren't influencing it. For the most part, they're not. It looks like if, if you're developing an app where people might be walking to get pizza, that they might actually be accurate for it. Um, I don't know how many people actually develop tools that do that, but if you did, they might be, if they have to walk there. Um, so overall, when you talk about ANOVA, this starts saying, do the questions actually influence um, people's estimations? And they don't um, in no cases. So in every case, the p-values are greater than point of us. So that tells us for the most part, people, um, the questions that you ask, which somewhat surprised me, but um, it ends up that doesn't. So as far as a study shows, that doesn't mean every case that, that you're using out there that it's not gonna happen. So that's all good, right? But you know, the title of this talk was spatial anchoring. So Dave, what in the hell does this have to do with spatial anchoring? Well, it's good because one of the things I mentioned earlier was I had randomized the zoom levels when people were searching. And I was very interested in that. Um, but before we dive into that, you know, the first question might be, well, what is anchoring? Um, and that's a great question to ask. Um, in cognitive psychology, there's this bias called anchoring. Um, and Kahneman and Traversky back in 1974 wrote a very influential paper called Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics, and Biases. <clears throat> if you ever read um, Thinking Fast and Slow, that's where this comes from. And he talks about, and Kahneman talks about that in that book. Um, and it really stems, anchoring really stems from this question with these numbers, where the, the two psychologists ask people to estimate the product of multiplying these numbers, which are really the same numbers, just in reverse order. The answer is 40,320. But every time they give this test, people estimate it the same. When it starts with one, they estimate it five, it, the average is around 512. When they start with eight, it's about 2,250. So what's happening is that lower number is anchoring people to go lower and the 
higher number in the beginning, it's anchoring them to go higher. What's interesting about anchoring is that no matter what um, topic or sector or any industry you're talking about, anchoring has been found. So in pricing, you've probably seen this on the internet and people will do this all the time. They'll put like, you see here, this ultimate price of $219 and they have the gold price. That's the one they really want you to choose. <clears throat> but it feels cheaper when they put 219 first. And this happens to people who even know about this um, bias. So now that you've heard it, and maybe you have heard it before, that even when you hear about it, you still fall victim to it. So even Common and Traversky found themselves falling for it. Um, other places it happens is sentencing for crimes, right? So they found that when the suggested um, sentencing was 10 years, that judges tended to um, give a sentence lower than when the, for the same crime, the suggested sentences was 30 years. They ended up doing, I think it was 20 years for the 30 and 10 for the 10. So it's, it's really important that people get this right and understand that. <clears throat> Some of the implications are, are profound if, when you're talking about sentencing. Um, same thing with food portions. You get a small food portion. You end up eating less than when you're given a large portion. I think a lot of people know this. Um, for me, what was interesting was I started wondering, well, if it's happening in all these sectors and it's happening everywhere and you can't escape it, it's got to be happening spatially. Right, so since I did the Zoom levels, um, the first thing I wanted to do is like, let's take a look at it. And you know, what would I expect to have happen? Well, with, with spatial anchoring, what I would expect to happen is that higher Zoom levels when you're zoomed in, I would expect for the most part, people to give lower distance estimations. And when they were at a higher Zoom or lower Zoom level and zoomed out, I expected to see higher distance estimates. Right, so when you look at the scattergram, it's, it's very clear. And that was, you know, for me, that was pretty exciting. So in all cases, right, we start to see this pretty um, significant um, relationship between zoom levels and distance. And just like we expected, the higher zoom level were giving lower estimates and the higher zoom levels were giving um, higher, higher estimates, right? So it's following exactly what we thought was spatial. And so apparently, at least in this study, and I would expect this to happen everywhere, that it's actually real. Um, and even more interesting, so this starts getting deeper into what I'm calling spatial anchoring, is um, what we're looking at here is the same thing when we're looking at accuracy with just individual stuff. I plotted accuracy at each zoom level. And the orange line is the, where we expected them to, to get and these circles, these little dots are p-values. So the bigger the, the dot, the bigger the p-value. And that means that when um, it's bigger, it's more accurate. So in these cases where the, lot, where the expected distance and um, the zoom levels cross are places where people were spot on to the estimation. And the p-values also were at a level that said they were accurate statistically, right? So that's really interesting. So your zoom level, can help people estimate distance better on that. So that gets really um, important when you're making a web tool. Um, so we can start d diving into the data and specifically, if you're talking about like walk, it, it, in at least my study around Zoom level 14, they became very accurate at, um, at estimating the walk distance. And same for mile at um, Zoom level 11 and 12. So it's changing because the distance is bigger, right? So. It has to kind of fit your extent. And I'll give you some examples after this, what that actually looks like. Um, with the drive time, the same thing. So even though the drive time, um, people were complaining and angry at me about you know, the, what I expected them to get, at some point they started getting accurate again. Now, of course, the total, if you look at this column DF, it's degrees of freedom, which is really the number of observations. <clears throat> it's pretty low, so it's hard to, really make a case for that. But I would suspect as I got even more observations at that zoom level 15 and 17, that what we would see is that it would, it would trend the same way. And I say that because I think that spatial anchoring is a real thing. Although I have very, I don't have a ton of proof I would need to design another um, study that actually focused in on it. Um, so just real quick, wanted to give you some examples. So for mile 
in Zoom level 12, which is one of the areas we saw, we, this is what it would look like on the study. And you'll notice that little buffer around it. Um, and when we get to walk, you're gonna notice the same type of buffer. So when you're talking about distance, this is the way you wanna think about it is, if, if you, no matter what the distance is, you wanna kind of put some buffer around that distance in whatever the target point is for the user, and then their estimations should match what it actually is, no matter what the distance is, right? Because <clears throat> when we look at wall, that buffer around the circle is about the same. So we can actually manipulate um, how people are dealing with um, distance estimations and maps by changing um, the zoom level and, and being aware of what that, what that looks like. Um, so, so I think that was a really interesting side note of a study that wasn't necessarily designed to find this. I ended up finding something that I think was a lot more interesting than initially. Um, you know, one thing to note is that people are probably still bad at estimating, but we can help them by tweaking the zoom level. Um, and I do have a, I'm gonna put this up here before I open up questions. You can see this, jot this down and after it, this is a new study for my um, master's thesis. It's actually for my master's thesis. If people wanted to jot this down and take it, that would be really cool. I wanna get, you know, it'd be cool if I got 400 more people. Um, so a little advertising here. Um, but now, um, great to open up for questions. Great. Thanks, Dave. That's a, a great presentation, uh, a, a great study. So there are a few uh, questions that have come in uh, on Attendee Hub. So um, let me read those out to you. Uh, Dr. Teddy Ocean uh, said um, she asked, uh, she wasn't able to join that at the very beginning, but she asked if you used AMT, Amazon Mechanical Turk, to run the survey. No, I did not use Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, I actually developed it myself. I mean, that's as a software designer, I also develop um, software. So I wrote it myself and um, wrote and just asked people to do it and just went on a massive campaign. I would ask coworkers, ask their, their friends. I asked friends, relatives. I would reach out to everywhere I could. And when that blogger took, got a hold of it, that's where it really jumped in the number. Um, and, and in the technical aspect behind it, it just writes to a Google Sheet, so it's kind of like a like a Google form in some ways. I just manipulated um, some code to make a Google Sheet like an API. Gotcha. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. And and she also asked and um, also provided a thought. She said, "What are the implications for visu visualization? And maybe distances need to be represented differently." Um, maybe some kind of distortion added intentionally to the map, so map distance matches perceived distance um, was her thought and question. Yeah, so distance is an interesting thing. So distance can be um, skewed other ways too. So when you have a lot of um, road networks, distance can get skewed even more um, on maps. But as far as anything else, like. I really do think after this, looking at the study, what, what's most important is going to be zoom level. Um, because this, even with drive time, which, you know, even if I reduce drive time, what I found by 25% as my estimation, they, people still didn't estimate it right. But at some point with that zoom level, they started estimating it correctly, which tells me that no matter what visual distortion you added, if you get the zoom level right with that kind of buffer like this, I think that's going to be really the key for helping people estimate distance and present them with a map on the internet. Um, so that, that's that's what I think now. Like I would need to do more studying of it to like kind of dig into that distortion piece. Sure. And then um, Aaron Lesh uh, commented that was a very cool study, and she said I would think there's some location bias too. People familiar with the location would be more accurate in estimating distance on a map regardless of scale. Yeah, yeah. so what's really interesting about that is like I would have, um, in, in this this study, like people were emailing me all the time about it, like questioning like people, um, people would run with their watch, would talk about how they really knew the distance and then they would get on here and estimate it incorrectly on the map. So I would, I would want, I mean, you know, that's just some anecdotal, so that's not like science or statistics telling me that. <clears throat> so I actually, not sure if I totally believe that, that I think that people think they are good at estimating stuff like distance, but the fact that people 
um, still got it wrong, even when they were so used to running on their streets with, with it. But that gets into like, this was Euclidean and that's not. So that could be part of the estimation distance. And one of the things I thought about um, is, is taking all, this, all the, the distance stuff I have. I could go back and do this and mm -hmm. do network analysis on it and say like, how far is it really in, on a, a road network and start doing the isochrones that way and then match it up to what they drew and see if they were accurate that way. Um, and I could still do that. And then we could get more into that type of question, answering that because you know is the, is that really the difference as opposed to um, the Euclidean versus the network distance? Right. Um, Robin Etheridge uh, asks: So the higher zoom level, zoomed in, produced the best estimate? Was her question? Um, well, not necessarily. It's it has to do with. It all has to do with a zoom level where you get kind of that buffer around the distance, right? So if you see here, there's like this buffer between the outer edges of the map, um, between the mile and the walk, which are two different distances, right? Um, it's roughly the same distance buffer around it where they became accurate. So I, I think it depends on the distance you're asking somebody to estimate. So what you wanna make sure of is that that buffer looks like this. So this is like, I'm calling this like a rule of thumb rather than anything else. <clears throat> it's just as a rule of thumb, you know, the dis, you know, to me, it's about double the distance that you want them to estimate. Like I would double that to make that the, the zoom level to fit on your map, which gets hard because people can resize a browser, but just to know, so it's kind of hard to always do that, but kind of rough it and just use it as a rule of thumb. All right. We have a couple more questions uh, here. Joshua Wilson said, is a potential application of this to add a map scale comparing miles to a five minute drive? Maybe, um, that's not something I really did for this. Um, and I actually intentionally left off the scale bar. I, I, in talking about scale bars, I contemplated um, randomizing, putting scale bars on, not putting them on, um, just to see if anyone actually used it, but not one person with all those correspondences I was getting mentioned a scale bar <clears throat> but i suppose you could i just seriously doubt with the you know, i do a lot of usability testing with maps and i've never seen anyone mention a scale bar so my guess is that people don't actually see the scale bar maps and that might be counterintuitive for gis folks but i don't think people actually see it yeah um natalie uh walton uh a comment. Well, she said, quite interesting. I experienced this with a citizen wanting an as the crow flies one mile buffer around their church so they could knock on doors and they were floored with how large the area actually was. Yeah. So, yeah, when yeah. you start looking at it that way, you uh, you don't realize how far a mile really uh, reaches. Yeah, it, that gets into that estimation that that's spurred me wanting to do this to begin with. So that's the, the exact um, um, scenario that I encountered. Right. We have time for one more question before we have to wrap up and transition. Um, Jason Mann said, thoughts on how this can be applied to provide a better pathfinding or navigation experience for map users? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and that's a little bit different than this, but it's kind of the same thing. It, it's really going to depend on the user perspective. Like, you know, if their pathfinding is like hiking, um, it might be a smaller distance that they're worried about. If they're biking, it might be slightly larger. So All right. you might want to consider um, then doing the same thing. If, they're dis if you want them to be able to estimate, um, if, the, if the person using that tool is trying to estimate like half mile increments <clears throat> for hiking, you might want to match that to the zoom level like right. this. And same thing with biking or riding a... Um, like off-road, like a motorcycle, a dirt bike, it might be a little bit bigger. And then you might want to make the zoom level a little bit different to match that distance estimation that you're looking for. Right. Well, Dave, I appreciate uh, your time today. If you want to throw up your URL there so people can see that as they, yeah. as we wrap up, feel free to please go to that and help Dave out and uh, provide some input. His email address is at the bottom of the slide there. So if you have additional questions or want more information, I'm sure Dave would be happy to uh, chat with you, so feel free to reach yeah. out to them. Um, we have 
a new round of sessions coming up at 10:30, so they're starting now. Feel free to jump over and pick which one you're going to. And uh, after that, we'll be followed by a break after the next round of sessions. So again, thanks, Dave, for your time. Yep. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye.